is a deep honor to join you as we pay tribute to a singular leader for our military and our nation, and one of the finest men that I know, General Martin Dempsey. Forty-five years ago, a telegram arrived in upstate New York at the home of 18-year-old Marty Dempsey. Congratulations, it read. You are appointed to the West Point class of 1974. I recall being at West Point during the Vietnam War. I fully expected, as did all of my classmates, that we would go to Vietnam. And I remember asking myself, why in the world would anyone want to follow me? If I told them to leave their base camp, you know, walk along a jungle trail, risking ambush or, or landmine, why would they do that? W what is it that causes someone to trust, which is really the, you know, the coin of the realm here, but why would someone trust another human being enough to risk their lives. And I made that my lifelong study. Over the decades that followed, he commanded divisions on desert battlefields and led America's soldiers. One of the primary responsibilities of leaders is to communicate. Early on in my career, I understood that making sense of things for your subordinates so that they can act with confidence and trust was an important part of being a leader. I'm Irish, and so I never had much trouble telling stories. But then I got to Baghdad. In 2003, I turned up in Baghdad to take command of the 1st Armored Division. The 1st Armored Division will be uh, doing what it gets paid to do tonight. And we began to take casualties. And of course, to recognize our casualties in the combat zone, we would conduct memorial services to help us remember the teammate that we had lost. And you've seen pictures of these services. It's usually a small wooden platform with an inverted rifle, a pair of boots, a helmet, dog tags draped over it. And I remember the first couple of times when I went to those ceremonies, I couldn't find the words. To, I just couldn't find the words to engage with a young man or woman who had lost their teammate. I didn't see this coming, frankly. I, I just wasn't ready for it. But in reflection, I probably should have anticipated that I needed to, to be prepared to communicate in a special way to those young men and women who had lost their fallen comrade, and I didn't have it. And I left those ceremonies, in both two or three cases, I left those ceremonies just wondering how, in, just, how can I find the inspiration in order to know what to say to these young men and women. And then one morning, I found the words. There was this phrase echoing in my head. It was, make it matter. And from that day forward, at every memorial service, at every encounter, with the young men and women who had lost their fallen comrades, I simply said to them, make it matter. And, and you could see, I mean, honestly, you could see them, you know, kind of awaken to the idea that, well, that's right. You know, we lost our fallen comrade. We can't undo that, but we can make it matter. I'm told that on Marty's desk, there's a box. Uh, it's a cigar box with 132 cards, each one with the name, picture, and story of every one of the 132 soldiers who gave their lives under his command in Iraq. And on top of the box are three words. Make it matter. The box is always whatever I consider to be my axis mundi. You know, whatever the center of my universe is, that's where the box is. So in retirement, the center of my universe is my home and it's my desk. And that's where the box is. What's powerful about the cards to me is what might they have been? How many generals, how many, how many sergeants, major, you know, fathers, grandfathers. <clears throat> There's so much potential in that box. I'm emotional about it, but I take enormous inspiration from it. And when you talk about make it matter, <clears throat> they, 
didn't have the opportunity to be who they could be. So we need to.